Welcome to episode 9. I'm Dan and today I'm going to keep my hand down as it got complained about a lot in the last bit. It's a review of Insignia Systems, NASDAQ listed, ticker, ISIG. Now as all of you who are subscribed to my channel will know, I spend a lot of time doing research and in a world where stocks have crazy valuations to current revenue or sometimes even forecasted revenues, it's nice to review a company that in my opinion is below where their stock price should be. If you enjoy the video, please subscribe and share with your friends. Appreciate all your help in growing the channel. So I've got 240 subs now after only eight videos. So that's amazing progress and thank you all. And hopefully once I hit a thousand subs, I'll be able to do a little bit of a giveaway to give something back to the community that supported me so far. Anyway, let's get straight into the seven point review process. And remember, if you want to skip to a certain section that you find more important than any other, I'll put all the links in the comment section below. So first up, what do they do? Let's go straight over to their website and check out a little bit more about Insignia Systems. So Insignia Systems are a marketing company and they specialise in in-store, display, on-pack and digital advertising spaces. They have some major customers as well. So if we scroll down, we can see here that they've got kind of Procter & Gamble, Walmart, PepsiCo, Unilever, just to name a few. The company's been majorly hurt by coronavirus. Not many shops have been able to open, although they seem to have kept respectable revenues through their food and drink related contracts. They offer in-store pop-ups and traditional display marketing. So if we look here, this is one of their main products and it's called a pop-up and you'll find them in all the supermarkets across the US. They also have traditional display marketing, but this isn't exactly what attracted me to the company. And let me say this very early on, that this stock definitely carries risk, but we'll get into that a little bit later on. Hopefully, as I give you more detail, you'll be able to make a decision on whether this investment is one that is worth taking. Unlock a few of the companies that I've reviewed recently. They have employees, they have major clients, they're transacting real revenues, and they have recently recorded a profit prior to COVID. So with all those points to consider, let's get into the financials and see how they stack up. So in order to review their financials, I've been through a list of sources, essentially their website, Simply Wall Street, and also the SEC filings, as well as a few other sources of information. And what do the financials tell us about this business? Well, I reviewed the latest financials in full, and I think the main things to kind of draw attention to are, first of all, starting with revenue. So revenue for 2020 was 17.7 million, and that was a de decrease of 19.5% from 22 million in 2019. Now, it shouldn't really be a surprise to most people that a company operating in direct sight of consumers has seen a downfall in revenues, primarily because most people have been at home for the past year, so there haven't been that many people to advertise to. Therefore, companies have probably slashed their advertising and marketing budgets. One of the points I want to focus on here, which is quite important, is the fact that the company's non-popped revenue increased 11% from 2020 versus 2019. So they're already trying to diversify, and there is a reason why they need to diversify. Primarily, the reason why they need to diversify is because of this next statement. So we will continue to have increased pressure on our POPs business heading into 2021, including the expiration, April 2021, of our 10-year selling agreement with News America Marketing. So essentially, 10 years ago, they had a court case with News America as a result of a monopolization case that Insignia Systems won. Let's say very early on that there could be a gap in the revenues for 2021, 2022. However, the company is clearly working towards bridging that gap. And I've got a few cool ideas which I think can help the company bridge that gap into the near future. And it says here as well, we previously announced our decision to optimize costs on our pop signage business by relocating our office into a significantly smaller space to save on lease expenses. So they're trying to take care of their costs as well and their fixed costs, things that they know that they can control. So I think it's been a wake up generally for a lot of businesses. And this is a good thing. So hopefully the company as they are going through their strategic shift, will come out on the other side with a much better business. So what we can see right in front of us now is their annual filing. And just to recap again, you can see that their total net sales dropped from 22 million in 2019 down to 17.7 million. One of the main things that attracted me to this company though is their assets. When I looked at the company's market cap and I saw 11 million, I was expecting to see really, really poor financials. But when you look into it here, you can see that they've got 7.1 million in cash alone. So to have a market cap of around 11 million is absolutely ludicrous. It should be at least double that. Then further to having 7 million in cash, total assets of the business are actually higher than the market cap. So right now, this company is looking like they're kind of primed for a hostile takeover where their total assets are actually more than the business is worth today. Now, the company isn't currently making a profit. We can see here that their earning per share is around minus 2.48, which actually improved from 2019. However, the company have recently made a profit, 
So we're going to jump over now to Simply Wall Street and have a look at the last time the company made a profit and also have a look at how their free cash flow is to see if the company did nothing else but just existed, how long would they exist for? In the financial years 2018 and 2019, the company was making profits of anywhere between 2.5% up to 4.9%. So this is actually really positive to see. It wasn't that long ago and sure, the profits had started falling off slightly before COVID, which is a concern. However, it proves that the company doesn't really need to make that much revenue in order to return a profit. And if we just drop down here now and click on free cash flow, you can also see as well the company is making really positive cash flow, which does probably explain why there is so much cash in the bank today. We can see here that in 2019 they had free cash flow of around 6 million, and then scrolling to the right, it was anywhere between kind of 2 and 1.1 million negative. So they do need to return to profits fairly quickly in order to sustain the cash burn. And if we just scroll down here, we can see the balance sheet. So there's only very minimal debt there. And also a real positive is this bit here, that they've got a stable cash runway. So ISIC has sufficient cash runway for more than three years based on its free cash flow. So essentially this seven million here can last the company for around three years without having to go and dilute their stock and raise extra funds at the expense of shareholders. So just to round off the financial, the company has no going concern status which is a massive thing that I always look for in companies that I'm going to invest in. Their assets are actually higher than their market cap, which is quite odd. Uh, they have cash sitting at around 60% of their market cap. And also, although 2020 was a tough year, actually it could be seen as an investment year and the future years ahead could be very, very bright. So now we're going to look at the share structure. And essentially that's recent insider buys versus sells, which hedge funds and venture capitalists own stake in the business, how many shares are outstanding, the flow size of the business, and anything else that might be applicable in this area. Seeing as we're already on Simply Wall Street, let's jump into the insider trading volume. Now we can see here the first kind of red flag, or the first thing that we should be concerned about, is this 1.5 million value that was sold three to six months ago. Now I've looked into that and I can't find any reason why that would have happened. There were buys at the same time, so it could just be uh, you know, investors decided to move their money, move it elsewhere. I couldn't find anything that stood out, but if you do know anything about it, please let me know in the comments section. I think the positive thing to note is that there's consistently insider buys, and there has been kind of nine to 12 months, six to nine months, three to six. And actually there was a few insider buys confirmed just recently the other day. I think that's part of the end of year bonus. The directors can opt for either cash or they can opt for shares in the company. And three of them opted for stock in the company, which is a really, really bullish signal and signalizes that they think there's better days ahead for this company. Now, if we briefly touch on the ownership breakdown, this is one of the major things that attracts me to this company. So you can see here that the general public float is less than 800,000 shares, which is extremely low. I think it's in kind of the top 20 lowest float stocks on the market today. Now a low float stock means it can be quite volatile. You can see quite big spreads, but when things go well, they go well quickly. And when things go bad, they go bad quite quickly as well. So it's quite a risky stock from that perspective. But let's look into who owns these stocks, you know, in terms of the institutions. So if we scroll down here and just click on show more, you can see that there's a range of companies. So we have BlackRock here, who own around 70,000 shares. You've got Vanguard Group, who own around 20,000 shares. And then also you've got Citadel down here, who own just short of 5,000 shares. Now, the fact that all these kind of investment firms are aware of this company is a really, really good kind of starting point. And it's only gonna take one big buy from any of these three. And let's face it, they've all definitely got the money to do it, to really, really boost his share price up quite considerably. And just to back up what I said earlier, we can see here on the 2nd of April 2021, Form 4 was completed for Insignia, which signalises that there was insider buying. And if we look here, we can see that 936 common stock were purchased for Jacob J. Burning. And on this one, 724 for Chad Bruce Johnson. And the final insider buy on the 2nd of April was for 936 common stock for Lauren, and you can pronounce his name. So if we focus now on the bull case, I'll put forward to you the positives of why I think it's worth buying this stock. So first of all, there's been insider buying in the last three months. And that's really positive because these people could be electing just for cash. However, they're asking for stocks which they think are gonna go up from this point in time. And when an insider buys, it's really positive because they ultimately know more about this stock and more about the company than we do. 
The second point on the ball case is that ultimately people make the business. And if you look at the CEO and the team that she's built around her, actually they've all come from extremely big companies, which suggests to me that these people know how to operate and deliver value for their clients, which would suggest that in the future, this company will continue to grow. Point three is that they have a great list of clients. Now, a new big deal with any one of these could easily boost their revenues by a massive percentage. There's lots of scope here for the company to improve. And from an 11 million market cap, I really do feel that the only way is up for this business, which in the current market conditions is actually a really positive position to be in because so many companies are valued over the top right now. To have one that is under fair value by a considerable amount is actually quite nice to have in your portfolio and just sit on and wait. And personally, I feel much more comfortable knowing that I'm invested in an undervalued company than one that is overvalued and waiting for that company to fill the void in their revenues. Point four is that I feel this is a forgotten area of COVID recovery. Footfall in shops will start increasing again. There will be less online grocery shopping and the brand war in shops will become more and more intense again. If you can get customers to be brand loyal right now, if there are any future lockdowns, you've pretty much got guaranteed business throughout the duration of those lockdowns. Point five is that I feel digital marketing will become even more relevant. And people have saved a lot of time during COVID and want to get to the point a lot quicker. So being directly linked to products and finding them a lot quicker will help an increasingly impatient society. Point six on the ball case is their financials. I think they're under fair value. Now, whether you think it's a fair market value or a fair financial value, I believe their share price should be at least $14 per share on a bare minimum financial value. And that's purely based on what their assets and the cash that they've got in the business. In terms of a fair market value, it really is hard to determine and it comes down to what people are willing to pay for that stock on any given day. However, don't be surprised if you saw positive PR, new contracts, that this stock would shoot up to around anywhere between the 25 to $30 mark, purely based on the fact that there's a 1 million float. So it would gain a lot of interest from day traders as well as investors. Now, I've mentioned this a few times. Now, the final point to consider here on the ball case is essentially the float. I've mentioned it a few times, but what the float means is the number of stocks available to trade. Now, when the number of stocks available to trade is lower, it leads to higher volatility. So essentially, when demand ramps up, there can be a scarcity of supply, which ultimately helps to propel the price higher and higher. Now, generally, you won't see tight spreads on stocks like this, and they can be a little bit of a waiting game. However, it's worth having a few of these in your portfolio even if you just do £100 or $100, because if a stock like this does catch a wave of momentum, you could easily two, three, four exit overnight. So in terms of the bear case, I think there's five points to focus on that I've been able to draw out over the past few days of research. Now, this is always hard to do, and I'm not a marketing professional, but if I was, what would I expect to see? So point one. Now, point one is I'd expect to see a more significant social media presence. Now, this is their Twitter and they've also got their Instagram set up as well. But I would expect to see a higher direct customer engagement on Twitter and Instagram. I'd be setting my team tough targets to build the brand online. And you could say, why is this important? It's their business to customer portal and therefore it's not really that relevant to their business and how well they do. Well, I would disagree because as a purchasing manager, the first thing I would check is how successful are they engaging with customers? And personally, if they were gonna do a pitch to me, the first thing I'd be looking for when buying a service like this is how much engagement do they get naturally on their own social media? And at the moment, it isn't high enough. Now, that does give us scope to improve, which is probably why I feel like this stock's undervalued and there is scope for the future. But they really do need to step up their social media game. If I had a marketing budget and I saw a company like this had over 5,000 followers and hundreds of interactions on a daily basis, I'd be far more inclined to give them the business than I would be someone else. Point two in the bear case is the revenues were declining slightly pre-COVID, although they had just made positive earnings. So it's important to be balanced here. And it's pretty clear they aren't a million miles away from becoming profitable, which is actually really good, but currently they're not. So there is work to be done. And in theory, a relatively small and agile firm, which is exactly what they are, should be able to turn this business around quite easily in one to two years after COVID. So point three in the bear case is a slightly different one, but for those of you in the UK who remembers these guys, so the NatWest Piggies, and just to make sure I'm covering this off from a global audience, who remembers Happy Meal toys? Now, some of these toys are worth upwards of kind of two to $300 or pounds, whichever currency you're using. 
and they become extremely invaluable and extremely valuable for collectors. So cutting to the chase, what's my point here? Well, I recently sent a tweet to the Insignia team and said, have your team thought about doing a rare, kind of scarcity branded NFT promotion on your digital platform? So for companies that have done physical goods such as Happy Meal Toys or NatWest did the UK collectible piggy banks, NFTs are the future. An idea like this could really help Insignia stand out from the crowd. NFTs, it's pretty clear, are gonna be massive in the future. Now, if they became one of the first companies to offer this from a branded perspective, say working with Heinz or Mars, this could help them really stand out from the crowd. And also, I genuinely believe that this would drive an extremely high volume of footfall towards those products that they were offering on. This would be unique, it would be one of a kind, it would be something that hasn't previously been done before. And that in itself would mean that the NFTs on offer would be worth a considerable amount and people would be doing all they could to chase these NFTs and the digital collectibles that Insignia and their branded partner have been able to bring to market. So why do I believe that a promotion like this would be a success for Insignia and their branded partner? Well, when I was younger, I used to collect something called Pulse and I used to spend most of my youth feeling up packets of crisps to work out which ones contain the Pulse so that I could go and buy them and then trade them with my friends. And I just feel as though if there was an opportunity to buy a product such as a Mars bar, and then you scan the barcode into an app, and then you could see if you'd won, say for example, one of 100 NFTs, that you can then go on to trade on a collectible marketplace with other users that are interested in Mars memorabilia. I feel like something like that could really, really drive up a lot of attention in products. And it's something really simple that Insignia could be selling to these brands and saying, look what we can do. And the reason why this is included in the bear case is there is so much opportunity here for the company to kind of explode onto the scene and start generating massive revenues just through driving a little bit more innovation. Now I've looked at the website and the stuff they do is pretty cool, but it doesn't really scream innovation to me. And there's a lot of different ways that you can advertise to people now. And I love to see things being doing differently. It attracts people. If nothing else, it gets people talking, which is essentially what Insignia are aiming to do. Point four is competition. Now, there is a lot of competition out there and it depends on your angle. Someone negative would say, well, surely they'll just float around where they are today. However, I think competition is generally always good and it should drive innovation. Now, couple point four and point three. If they did do something different in the future, you could see a spike in the market cap. However, competition is definitely something to consider when deciding to invest in Insignia or whether you don't. Point five and the final point in the bear case is Insignia, a party to significant litigation. So I'm not a lawyer, but there is an ongoing legal case with Insignia and News America, and also a counter case for News America versus Insignia. The two businesses have been arguing since around 2003. And to be quite honest, it sounds like it's a fairly resource heavy and draining court case. From reading through the transcripts, it looks like both sides have fair points to argue. And personally, I wouldn't be surprised if it was thrown out with no definitive decision. But again, I'm not a lawyer, so it's worth reading yourself. And as always, I've put links for anything discussed in this video in the comment section for you to check at your own leisure. So that wraps up the bull and the bear case, and we'll go on to technical analysis now. But just a bit of a pre-warning, there is a live session ongoing, so you may see prices jumping around. So due to the low float on this stock, I have had to zoom out to around one day, because quite simply, if we go to a minute, it's really, really jumpy, and you can't really see a lot. So going back to one day, what can we see here? So we can see that in the past there have been some real big spikes on the one day candles. So massive spikes up. And the reason that that's been able to happen is simply due to the low float that I've talked about earlier. So as I said earlier in the video as well, I have currently invested in this stock. So we can see here, I've got around 4,000 uh, units of the stock. <clears throat> so if we look at the charts and we take from the low point of this candle here and the low one of this one here, we can see that around the kind of 560, 570 mark, is where this typically kind of hits lows and then gets some quite good support. So we've had a little bit of a bounce off it here around the 570 mark, 560 mark, and it's bounced back up. Now it's currently trading at around 650 and has a sell price of 627 per share. Um, although if you look at the level two data, it does actually suggest the sell price is quite a lot higher than that. Uh, and if we take from this candle here and kind of come down on the peaks, you can see that it's kind of in breakout stage. It does suggest here that if we can get a breakout around the six eighty to seven dollar range, that the stock could travel up quite quickly from there. It's a significant range for a few reasons. So we can see here as well that if we track along the EMA two hundred line, 
but it's just above the EMA 200 line, which is good. That's a bullish kind of signal. But negatively, it's below the EMA 50. Now, this won't show up on a lot of people's scanners until it goes above EMA 50 and above EMA 200. So if the stock can kind of edge up towards the $7 range and hold it, you'll soon start to see it getting a lot more interest from traders and investors. We can see here on the awesome oscillator that it's gone through a period of selling and actually it's starting to trend up. So we want a few more green days here and we want the awesome oscillator to become positive, which again will give bullish signals to day traders and investors. If we look at the MACD line as well, the MACD line is positive. Uh, we can see that the faster moving line has crossed over with a slower moving line and is now trending up. So that signal in itself is, is bullish. But what we really need is a share price of above $7 and then it will be ticking kind of all the boxes that we need to attract a much higher volume to this stock. And if I just drag across the level two data, we can see here that there's some resistance around the 669, 670 mark, but you know it's not really a lot. It's a few thousand dollars, few thousand pounds. And actually this could quickly be up at $7.44 in next to no time with very, very little volume. So all in all, a bit of a mixed chart at the moment, um, but anything plus $7, I think really starts to send all the bullish signals to everyone that should be interested in getting into this stock. So this brings me on to what am I gonna do? So we'll hop over to the tracker now and I'll just take you through all the points on there and wrap it up. So here we are on the tracker and you can see I've added Insignia Systems. So ticker, ICIG, it's on NASDAQ and there's today's date in the British format. Uh, current price just checked on where the screen is 649 so that's the buy price not the sell price in terms of the financials so what have i scored them well i've scored them a three and actually they're in really good financial position uh, assets including cash far outweigh any loans or debt um, they haven't got massive kind of bills in terms of wages and things like that and just because it's a micro cap it's really hard to score them a full five because there's always a bit more risk there and also the fact that revenues have declined gets another point taken off. So I've scored them a three. Uh, it's probably around the 3.5 in all honesty, but I've marked them down just to err on the side of caution. In terms of growth, I've scored them a four. I think it's a great time for them to expand. And also the world of creative marketing in general is going to be very busy once the world snaps back to normality. Over the next few months, there'll be higher competition for brands to stand out, especially in areas such as health foods. As more people try to diet, and lose weight post lockdown. And let's face it right now, if the company were to announce something like an exclusive NFT offering for downloading partners apps and buying products, this would instantly be a five. There would be a hell of a lot of growth overnight. Then if we look at how attractive this business is, so it's in a fairly stable industry with quite a lot of competition. And by default, it means that these products and services are needed, so they are attractive. And because businesses keep popping up all the time, trying to gain market share and build into the industry, then I think it should score quite highly. I think their digital marketing is more attractive. I think there's much more opportunities around that. So I've scored it a four in terms of their attractiveness. Now in terms of risks, I've scored them a three and I would have been happy to score them a lot lower if it wasn't for the fact that revenues are declining. You know, based on the assets and cash position alone, it should really be a one because they're financially sound and financially secure. And therefore in terms of how risky this is, is it gonna to go to zero? I think that's really unlikely. They've got a really solid base of customers, all huge companies, all likely to have marketing budgets in the future. Insignia recently have recorded profit, and if it wasn't for COVID, I actually think the company may have already turned this position around and be in positive earnings again. And the final point to mention, and it isn't a minor point, is that the News America contract or agreement ends relatively soon. And with having that on the horizon, it does boost the risk factor slightly to a three. In terms of overall rating, I've scored this company a four, in terms of what am I going to be doing, well, you've already seen in the video that I own this stock and I'll continue to hold it for a matter of weeks until I think it's hit its fair value or other alternative options that I'm currently tracking become too good to miss out on. This is a different type of stock to those that I've previously reviewed and it's more a case that I feel this stock is under fair value and also has a low float which could quickly turn around the price. If this is something that you think of has a real long-term future, then great and you could continue holding it, no problem. And my personal view is that a fair value of this company should be around $26 based on the assets and the revenues of the company. It should probably have a market cap of anywhere between 45 and 50 million at the very least. But then that all depends on what you think is a fair financial value versus what the fair market value is. And that wraps it up for today. I hope to those of you that have watched it all the way through, you found it interesting. And I hope it gives you a slightly different angle on investing 
than I've previously covered in my videos. Personally, I feel if you put just a small amount into this, it's a nice one to watch and see what happens in the short medium term as a COVID recovery play. So there's nothing else to say now other than thank you for watching. I hope you've all had a happy and safe Easter with your loved ones. If you wouldn't mind hitting that subscribe button and getting me over that 250 mark, that would be great. And I can also let go of a hand now, which I've been trying to keep down all the way through the video based on comments from the last video. Happy investing and stay safe for the week ahead.